This is section six of Mark Twain's Journal Writings, volume one, by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Grasses in the South, by Mark Twain, read by John Greenman. The following is taken from that able and excellent weekly, the Mobile Sunday Times, whose agricultural columns are edited by C. C. Langdon, Esquire. The following communication is from a veteran southern agriculturist, a gentleman of high character and great intelligence, who, before the war, was not only a large cotton planter, but, at the same time, a successful farmer, horticulturist, pomologist, and stock-raiser. No man in the South has done more than he to prove the perfect adaptation of our soil and climate to that diversification of pursuits which the stern logic of events has rendered necessary to the future prosperity of the land we love we will vouch for the entire truthfulness of all the statements of our correspondent what he has done others can do if they will stonewall mississippi may twenty one eighteen sixty eight Honorable C. C. Langdon, under your department in the Sunday Times, I read, the cotton theorists hold that farm products and the rearing of horses, cattle, hogs, etc., cannot be made to pay or to compete with colder climates, because they say that the grasses cannot endure the heat and dryness of our long summers. I am satisfied that this is a mistake, and I feel certain that no scientific and careful test has yet been made of the fitness of our climate for these, I will call them, pastoral grasses. See page 6, May 17, signed Ben Lane. Will you allow Mark Twain to say he had clover in 1837 and up to May 1863 when he abdicated his high calling in favor of the hired foreign soldiery of the best government the world ever saw? There may have been no scientific and careful tests, but nevertheless for over twenty years in latitude thirty-two degrees I had the clovers having tried the red, white, yellow, scarlet, as also of the grasses blue, timothy, orchard, a red top, and largely of the Bermuda, at least enough of pastoral grasses. I call them the cultivated grasses, to distinguish them from the wild grasses or natures, though some of these do not succeed unless the land is in a state of culture, the crab and crowfoot, for instance. If Ben Lane had visited Mark Twain from 1840 to 1860, he would have seen those grasses. And I, a cotton theorist, affirm after thirty-five years' experience, no science in the cotton field, that we cannot compete with colder climates, the same policy pursued change the policy put the land in a state of drainage when it will bear subsoiling twelve to eighteen inches deep then sow the grasses profusely and mark twain pledges his good name that no climate outside of the ruinated spoiled confederacy can compete with us when i left never to return to my home i had largely for my means horses cattle hogs, sheep, and goats, never permitting one of them outside of my fence unless taken out for use. I had brood mares, a pure Morgan stallion, an imported jack, thoroughbred Devon bulls, thoroughbred imported Ayrshire bulls, and sent off just before I dodged out, after the clock on my mantle chimed low twelve, and lay out in the swamp until peep a day, and left forever a South Down ram imported in his dam. He cost only six hundred dollars with South Down and pure Saxon and Merino ewes. Sufficient. 
i had over one hundred head of horses mules colts and fine cattle that never needed to be fed from corn-house or barn there being pastoral grasses enough for them three hundred and sixty-five days in each year others can do this if they will and until southern men become planters and look the necessity of the thing square in the face and act up to duty we will be always dependent upon the northern men and the eastern who have no more love for me us than i we have for them i use somebody's fictitious name for this time mark twain End of Grasses in the South by Mark Twain, read by John Greenman.